At Cambridge Trust, we believe that living well is about more than just managing your wealth. It's about staying intrigued, informed, and inspired. I'm Michael Duca, Executive Vice President at Cambridge Trust Company, and this is the Cambridge Trust Thought Series. Hi, my name is Nico Mealy. I am the author of The End of Big. I'm uh, on the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm the founder of a company called Echo and Company. We don't have very good language to talk about the technology and our time. You know, your phone is not really a phone. It's much more than that. Phone is such a weak word to describe it. We talk about digital, but that doesn't really encompass the full scope of the change we're seeing. We, we just don't have good language. And in writing the book and in trying to figure out how to talk about the impact technology is having on our time, um, I was searching for, for words that felt like they carried the power and the weight that really accurately described what's happening. And I settled upon the term radical connectivity. Never before in human history have so many people been connected to each other uh, with such great frequency, at such low cost, with such immediacy, without hierarchy or institutional intervention. It's a radical kind of connectedness and it is reshaping just about every part of our lives from grocery shopping to picking up the kids from school to even the way we pay for things, uh, the nature of money. All of it is being changed by our technology, by radical connectivity. I think for me, this all came together on the Howard Dean presidential campaign. When I went to work for Howard Dean, he was running for president, but nobody had heard of the guy. He, you know, he was, he'd been the governor of Vermont, but that was hardly a national office. Um, you know, I remember that we were polling below Al Sharpton. We were actually within the margin of error. People might have accidentally chosen our name in the poll, and that was how we got there. Uh, there, were, there was a handful of employees. It was a very small operation. And it was also, you know, I remember the New York Times would write about the presidential election, and they would say, John Kerry, Joe Lieberman, John Edwards, and five other Democratic presidential candidates Never once did Howard Dean get a mention, right? Al Sharpton got more mentions than, than, than Howard Dean. But we had noticed that some, some blogs would pop up talking about Howard, that when he would go somewhere and give a speech, there'd be this explosion of local activity on the internet about Howard Dean. And since the mainstream media wasn't returning our phone calls, uh, right, since they didn't care about Howard Dean, we'd call up these bloggers because they cared about Howard Dean. And if you can believe it, in about 90 days, that, that kind of distributed individual blogging snowballed from taking a guy who was a, who was a nobody, who was an afterthought, to making him the front runner in the race. In 90 days, we went from Howard Dean being a footnote and afterthought, never mentioned by name, to outraising John Kerry almost two to one. And it was with astonishing speed and it was completely due to distributed random people out there on the internet. And that moment, the speed with which that happened, the intensity with which it happened, the way it completely challenged the status quo, the status quo of the Democratic Party and the status quo of the media establishment, that, that was, I remember waking up and thinking, whoa, what has just happened? Radical connectivity pushes power out of institutions to individuals at an alarming and also exciting rate. This means that, you know, the traditional institutions that govern some of the parts of our life, uh, like, like American political parties, these are institutions that in many ways are very weak. Their original purpose and intent, which was to be a grassroots network of local parties, has been eroded over time. And in many ways, both parties are mostly big cocktail parties for major donors. 
And so here you have this traditional institution whose job was to identify political talent, cultivate it, bring it up the ladder uh, in a grassroots distributed kind of way, kind of becoming almost a parody of itself. And it's in that kind of environment that radical connectivity empowers people to be very disruptive. You know, in uh, 2007, it was unthinkable that Barack Obama would defeat Hillary Clinton. Hillary had spent her whole life running for president. She'd worked on every presidential campaign since she was 18. If you go to the Democratic Party headquarters in Washington, D.C., it quite literally has her name on it because she and her husband built the modern Democratic Party. So how did a man who'd been in public life less than a decade defeat her? How did that happen? It was because in part, the, the traditional advantages of the establishment party, the party was weak, and the internet, the technology, radical connectivity, made it easy to build an alternative power structure. We see that in the Democratic Party in 07 and 08. We've seen that the last two political cycles with the Tea Party challenging the Republican Party. In 2012, 2010, We've seen um, over a dozen U.S. Senate candidates where the Republican establishment candidate is defeated by a Tea Party challenger who comes out of nowhere. Three sitting U.S. senators losing in their own primaries, almost unprecedented in American history. And so as I look down the next decade, especially the next political cycle, I think it's dangerous to assume that anyone is a front runner. Dangerous to assume any kind of advantage to incumbency. Everyone talks about Hillary Clinton as kind of the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party. That turned out not to be true in 2008, and I'm not sure why we should assume that's true today. If we look across all the different parts of American life, in some places, it's the, the impact of radical connectivity is clear and powerful and absolutely changing the landscape. We can look at news and the decline of newspapers. We can look at entertainment from books to music to movies uh, to TV, people watching Netflix and YouTube instead of traditional television. We can even look at higher education and see the way that lectures are moving online and distance learning and online education are disrupting the traditional university setting. Uh, across a whole bunch of parts of American life, the impact is clear. There are some areas where it seems like it's getting bigger than ever before. Look at big banks, uh, big real estate. There is, in some sense, an even greater and greater consolidation. But I see that as temporary, as the kind of last consolidation before the collapse, you might say. In the case of, for example, big banks, uh, I see kind of three clear trends challenging a lot of the fundamental assumptions that our economy and banks are built on. The first is 3D printing and on-demand fabrication. The idea that you could actually just print stuff at home, like shoes and clothes and chairs, rather than go to Walmart and buy it. The second thing that's disrupting the economy is uh, is the sharing economy, is you know something like relay rides where you park your car and then someone else comes and picks it up and uses it almost like a rental car, right? Uh, about the way the internet takes down all of the barriers to sharing and bartering and takes us beyond a currency economy. In some of the most troubled economies in Europe, Greece and Spain in particular, there's been an explosion of apps that allow you to barter without currency, barter goods and services. One in particular, Barter Card, claims to have done north of $4 billion transactions, $4 billion worth of transactions a year. So we have 3D printing on-demand fabrication, we have bartering and sharing, and then the third thing is digital currency. Uh, you know, technologies like Bitcoin are really, really changing kind of the very underlying nature of money and what it means to have an exchange of value. And so for now, the banks appear to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there are other examples in industry and other places. But I, like I said, I think it's very temporary in that in a long view, the technology is going to make it really hard for big incumbent players to stay big. There are seven websites, seven internet companies that effectively control all the public space online. And you know them. Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Skype, which is how Microsoft sneaks in, and Twitter. And those seven companies, you know, the oldest of them is Apple, the youngest is Twitter. 
uh, all represent a different piece of an emerging digital world. Uh, you know, you could start with Amazon being the kind of delivery mechanism to get physical goods. You order physical things online and then they show up actually at your house. Uh, you think of Apple as kind of driving the mobile phone revolution with smartphones. You know, eBay just really totally revolutionized transaction processing and payment systems and marketplaces. Um, Facebook created this new class in a sense, the social network, right? We didn't even really know what that was a decade ago. And still not sure we really know what that was. Skype changed the very nature of phone conversations and long distance. Google makes the entire world's knowledge available to every human being who has internet access. Um, and Twitter is creating a, a new vehicles for public conversation. All of those in their different ways have had a profound impact on our world. And you could point to each one of those companies hitting a moment where it, boom, changed the culture, shaped the future. One of the real concerns for me, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I was wondering what gets lost. Like, let's say newspapers disappear tomorrow, and many of them are disappearing at an alarming rate. Let's imagine NBC, people stop watching it. They're watching YouTube and Netflix. Will we, will we lose anything if we lose NBC? We lost most of the record companies. What gets lost? In the case of entertainment, we're losing an organizational layer, right? An or, uh, kind of a middle layer uh, of organizations that helped identify, cultivate, and recruit talent, and create audiences for that talent. What do I mean by this? Well, in 1967, uh, one of the top 10 highest grossing films of the year was a film called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. It was a film about interracial marriage, featuring some of the biggest names of the day and biggest actors and actresses of the time. When it came out, nationwide distribution, there were over a dozen states where interracial marriage was illegal. And this was part of kind of a growing conversation in the country about race, about civil rights. And here was a movie, a fictional story featuring big movie stars that helped shape the culture in that way. And that's something, that kind of shared public experience is something we are definitively losing as people tune into very narrow experiences of entertainment. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of the Cambridge Trust Thought Series. For more Thought Series events, podcasts, articles, and videos, please visit cambridgetrust.com.